I feel that, uh, that I'm going to go to Dallas. I've talked to Bob, and, and uh, I, I think it's safe to say that I'm going to go to Dallas with him. What was your reaction when you heard the news, and how did you hear it? Well, you know, uh, I had the radio on. I, I got home real fast last night because I, when you know, that's gone on in the last uh, three or four months about uh, his, his circumstances and his problems here. I had the radio on. I had the television on, and uh, I had them both going. And uh, I got a call about uh, I think Kendall saw something like that last night, and uh, he just simply said, "Hi, Ted." He said, "Now I'm a DC boy at heart, and." Uh, I'm disappointed as hell our ball club leaving because uh, my friends are here, I've made my money here, I've, my career has been made here. And uh, I, I don't think that you, you can just up and, and leave uh, without uh, some kind of sentimental attachment or uh, a loyalty or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, I have to, this is certainly, uh, I, I just never dreamed that a ball club would ever move out of Washington, D.C. Have you, uh, with an eye toward the fact that this might happen, uh, ever checked out the length of the fences in Arlington, Texas? Uh, no, and uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, wouldn't don't care to. Uh, um, like I said, I when this when the, the all the franchise shift talk came up, uh, nasty. I mean, I never paid that much attention because I, I just never thought it would happen. I really didn't, and. Uh, uh, and like I say, I, before I issue a formal statement, I feel like I, I still work for Bob Short. And uh, I just feel like I owe him the courtesy and the loyalty of being my boss to down and discuss my personal future with his organization, if I have any. Uh, and then I think at that time I'll make my own formal statement. But uh, I'm not going to try to hide the fact that I'm disappointed. What type of a game are you looking for against Missouri? Well, <laughs> number one, I'm looking for a dry game. I'm looking for a field that's dry and a little sunshine. As you know, at Oklahoma, we not only faced a tremendous football team in the University of Oklahoma, but we faced uh, very poor weather conditions as far as trying to get the flying wishbone off the ground. Uh, some one of the major coaches was quoted, and I guess it was Jim Pittman, saying the greatest improvement your team makes is between the first and second game of the season. Do you agree with these sentiments? I'll let you know after we play Missouri. <laughs> I don't have any way I know. I know we have an exceptionally young ball club. We should improve with each ball game, and it may possibly be four or five games into the season before we really have a good ball club. But I, I, I truly believe that SMU will have a good ball club but unless we just get keep personnel injured and can't play. But uh, each game we should improve, and uh, with uh, Missouri being no exception this week. What were some of the highlights of uh, the game? What did you see that, uh, I'm not trying to be humorous, really, there, there were some good things there, weren't there? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there were a lot of good things. We look real good breaking the huddle and getting to the line of scrimmage, Jerry. Yes, sir, I wasn't expecting to carry the ball very much this game. During the foul scrimmages, I'd been carrying it maybe three or four times. I used mainly as a blocking back, but they kind of played for our outside game and just left me open up the middle, so they kept giving it to me. What about against Washington? You figured they're going to give you the ball that many times? Well, it depends on what their defense is doing. We're going to try to control the ball uh, and keep the ball away from Sonny Six Killer. You know, he's pretty dangerous when they get the ball. Does the name Sonny Six Killer have any uh, worries for you? Well, the defense is going to worry about that. We're just going to try to keep the ball. Unless something is done, the jails in Dallas County, Texas, Tarrant County, or any place else cannot hold these inmates, and each day they increase. I would like to pass another resolution, and we will get all the support from the county, all the citizens in Dallas County. The district attorney is interested. The County Sheriff is interested to relieve us of this responsibility 
that is not ours. These people were convicted, sentenced in a state court, and here they are, our responsibility, because of the lack of legislation. And I would like for us to pass another resolution, one of many that we pass, asking the legislature to pass enabling legislation to where these inmates can go to the state penitentiary while they're on appeal. This is untrue, and fortunately, there were some highly credible people, as far as the establishment is concerned, with me in the cell block, like Tom Wicker of the New York Times and Congressman Badillo, and a whole variety of state legislators. I told the prisoners expressly that the 28 proposals that were accepted were the best they could get. I also told them that it was their decision to make. and. Their decision was to continue negotiations. If negotiations had continued, it would be over by now, and there would not be a single dead man buried anywhere out of Attica. The group met again last night in a lengthy and heated session which didn't break up until after midnight. This time, there were the three delegates from the labor unions there, but again, no contract was signed. At one point, they agreed to break up into executive session, hoping that perhaps a smaller number of people could come nearer arriving at a conclusion. The only conclusion arrived at was the minority representatives were concerned that they might be outvoted if a smaller number of people were retained. Floyd Cranfill of the Dallas office of the Labor Department is involved with the Contract Compliance Division of the Labor Department. He has been sitting in on the meetings for these past 14 months, and he is, frankly, a little bit unhappy with the way the meeting went last night. Well, I think that at this point, Really, I have no choice but to recommend the convening of hearings preparatory to the imposition of an imposed plan in Fort Worth. Cranfield said it was his hope that eventually the people in Fort Worth would be able to arrive at a conclusion, a hometown plan which they all could live with. But he said, unless some of the labor unions sign it, there is no sense sending it to the Labor Department because it simply cannot be passed. He did say that with the signatures of a few labor unions, at least it could be considered. But, he said, at this point, we're pessimistic even about that. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move at the Labor Department in Dallas. I understand that you, you say you prefer a choppy lake rather than a smooth lake? Well, a smooth lake, oh, it'll be good competition. The, the speeds, the average speeds will be down a little bit. Uh, for instance, we'll... Uh, because the friction areas are, are increased, if it's a, a little chop, about 8 or 10 inches or 12 inches, uh, then the boat gets up and gets free and gets moving uh, cleaner and freer with more air coming underneath the boat, and so it becomes really a, a water-bound airplane. So uh, our average speeds will be somewhere between 105 and 110, but we'll be running, to gain those speeds, we'll be turning 150 or 60 in the fairways. You know, one thing beautiful about hydroplane racing is there no possibility of danger, is there? <laughs> No, I, I did want to say, <laughs> I did want to say this that out at uh, out at Lake Dallas uh, on that day, from a spectator point of view, though this is a historic first for the state of Texas, uh, it's a beautiful body of water, particularly for spectators. It's a natural amphitheater out there, and and there is lots of room for viewing and family picnicking and to enjoy a five-hour, relatively inexpensive afternoon. So I'm uh, we're really happy about it. But. Uh, does, does the possibility, now I know that you've been involved in many, many crack-ups, and these, these are an element of the challenge in hydroplane racing. Uh, why does one keep going back? Uh, I know this is an essential question in all of sports, but certainly in hydroplane racing where you really do face the possibility of serious injury, it, it must be vital. Well, our sport has been defined as one of the cruel sports, I know, and I hate to define it or reduce it to its <laughs> the ultimate in simplicity. I think that old jazz about why, uh, because the mountain, you know, the mountain is there. I think it's because it's a, it's a marvelous feeling to win.
These boys are students in Fort Worth's Western Hills High School. What they're doing is testing themselves to see how far they can run in 12 minutes. It's a pilot program being conducted by Dr. Kenneth Cooper of Dallas. You'll remember he's the former Air Force doctor who wrote the best-selling books on aerobics exercise and, in fact, made aerobics a household word. 3,800 Fort Worth students have been tested. Half of those will go through the aerobics activities program. The other half will go through normal phys ed classes for 15 weeks. At the end of that time, both groups will be tested again. I asked Dr. Cooper to describe what he hopes to learn from the test. We're trying in Fort Worth to determine the effectiveness of their physical education programs, particularly in their senior high school programs. We're starting a program with the senior high school boys that hopefully will spread on into the senior high school girls and the other systems in the Fort Worth school system. What we're trying to determine is the effectiveness of their PE programs, yes, but then the level of fitness versus many things, absenteeism, academic, academic performance, and things of that type. When you go into a program like this, you obviously have certain objectives in mind. What do you hope to prove with the 12-minute test? Well, first of all, we're going to determine their level of fitness by the 12-minute test, which correlates very well with laboratory studies. It's measured on, say, the treadmill. But then we hope to be able to show that the students who are physically fit make better grades. And the students who are physically fit have less absenteeism during the school year from sickness. And maybe even show some relationship between drug usage and the level of fitness. That's what we hope to show in this program. Do you feel that uh, your program will gradually replace the uh, traditional physical education system? Yes, I, I think an, aerobic, an aerobically oriented program needs to replace the standard PE program. We've been doing studies all over the country, evaluating various school systems, and some school systems have superior programs. Other school systems do not. Those that do invariably have some aerobically oriented type PE program, which includes sustained walking, running, cycling, or swimming, something of that type. We have many schools in this country now that are using the aerobics program in their school system, and I think you're going to see a lot more in the future. Aerobics means, literally, living in air. Dr. Cooper discovered while in the Air Force that the true test to physical fitness is the quantity of oxygen your body will consume. He's continuing his studies here at the Institute of Aerobics Research in North Dallas, a nonprofit science center that's not yet completed. If the Fort Worth experiment works out, it'll be expanded to finally include junior and senior high students, male and female. From there, well, several states across the nation are interested in using Fort Worth as the model for aerobics programs of their own. Maybe sometime in the distant future, Americans may spend less money to recover from sickness and more time to keep from getting sick, possibly through aerobics. J. Lewis, Channel 8 News on the Move in North Dallas. Mr. Speaker, can you give us a statement? Let's clear out. Can you clear out of the statement, way? Statement, Mr. Speaker. Over here. Right. Will that be all your right. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go.
question from a lot of people was answered today by the Travis County Grand Jury. People have been wondering why only slaps on the wrist so far from the so-called Great Texas Stock Scandal. But today, the Travis County Grand Jury issued three criminal indictments naming four persons. Those include House Speaker Gus Mutcher, who was indicted for accepting a bribe, and an indictment for conspiring to accept a bribe, which names Speaker Mutcher, also one of his aides, Rush McGinty, and Representative Tommy Shannon of Fort Worth. The third indictment is against John Osorio, former president of National Bankers Life Insurance Company, for making a false statement to the State Board of Insurance. Those persons were named by the Travis County Grand Jury, and apparently those are the only ones that will be indicted from this particular investigation. They were called by Sheriff T.O. Lang here in Travis County, and Mutcher and McGinty then came to the courthouse to surrender to the sheriff's office and be booked into the jail. They posted bond $20,000 by Mutcher, $10,000 by McGinty. However, both men refused to make any statements on their way in. On the way out, however, after the booking procedure, we did get Speaker Mutcher to answer a few questions. Yeah, could, you, could you just stop long enough and tell us what's in your statement, sir? Can you just tell us what's in it? That's all we're asking you. Well, I, I, I prepared the statement, and I don't recall exactly what well, it is. Well, can you tell us generally what's in it? I know, gentlemen, that I'm uh, somewhat tired and uh, a little bit disappointed. I, I got the news naturally through you people last night, and you had my family and my wife's family all to bed all during the night. And I think the statement itself pretty well reflects our feelings and the type of treatment we've received. In the Do you plan to stay on as speaker even through this? Well, if they don't elect somebody from the press room, I probably will, yes. Do you think it's the fault of the press? I mean, do you think it's a, a charge like that's the fault of the press? I, I have no further statements. You might talk to my attorney. They'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, did they treat you all right up there? <laughs> <laughs> The court can rule, as I see it, in three ways. First, they can order the Legislative Redistricting Board to redistrict the House. Second, they can hold that there has not been a regular sen uh, session of the legislature following publication of the census, and therefore the whole matter goes over to 73. Or third, they can uh, say that a special session should be called to redistrict the House. Now, you say they can can re recommend that a special session be called. They cannot order one. No, only the governor of Texas can call a special session. No court has the power to order him to call a special session, as I understand the law. He has already said he will not do so, hasn't he? That's correct, yes. So then what would be the next step? Then I think someone might very well go to federal court and seek to get an order from a federal court that if the legislature is not called into special session and if it does not redistrict prior to January 1st, that then the court would adopt a redistricting plan on its own. I think two of the most important facets of our race for Lieutenant Governor of Texas uh, in this coming session will be ethics and economy. Uh, certainly uh, no one in state leadership no position of state leadership can be effective unless the people of this state, the 11 million people of this state, believe in them from a standpoint of ethics and standards of conduct. I'll hit very heavily on this during my campaign. And when I talk about economy, I'm talking about people from the corporate president down to the worker, the man on the lathe, the man in the shop. I think the most important facet to him is whether or not I'm going to have a place to work, whether I can go home to my family and say that I can retire the payment on my car, I can retire the mortgage, I can educate my young. With Lockheed closing down practically, with Bowen in Seattle and Wichita almost a ghost town, the Ford Motor Company moving out of Dallas, and more small businesses going broke in the last four years than in the last 25, I think economy has to be one of the important facets in this race. What about economy and government, Senator? Yes, of course we need economy and government. It's for that reason that I've not laid out a tax bill. I think first we need to be budget riders. We need to cut the fat out of Texas government. The city of Dallas is starting a program to virtually rebuild White Rock Lake. The lake was built in 1911 to act as a city water supply. Since then, it's virtually filled up with silt in some places, and in recent years, it's had a flooding problem. Today, the Park Department revealed a three to five million dollar plan for redoing the lake and surrounding park. 
Quoting from a report by consulting engineers Forrest and Cotton, Park Department officials told the East Dallas Chamber of Commerce about plans to dredge parts of the lake to six feet in depth, removing more than two and a half million cubic yards of sediment and reclaiming 100 acres of parkland, rebuilding the dam and spillway to its original height and bracing it, and building bike trails around the lake. Depending on various options, the cost of the program could run from $2,900,000 to almost $5.5 million. But Park Department officials are convinced the cost would be worthwhile to give the old lady what they consider is a much-needed facelift. Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News on the Move at White Rock Lake. The ninth annual Texas State 4-H Horse Show is being staged here at Will Rogers Coliseum over a month late this year. The postponement was due to the V, Venezuelan equine encephalomyelitis epidemic that hit the Texas horse population earlier this year. Some of the 4-H'ers who had hoped to participate in the Fort Worth show aren't here today, mainly because of the epidemic, like one girl near Corpus Christi who lost three horses. Corpus Christi was within the initial quarantine of horses in South Texas. Ernest Turner, from the Corpus Christi area, brought one of his mares through the fever with help from Perry Biles, a druggist in Corpus Christi. Biles said that the V vaccine helped to save horses, but human drugs were also used. We consulted with uh, the vets and MDs and we used uh, anticonvulsant drugs and pain relieving drugs and tranquilizing drugs that are used on humans today uh, that has never been used on horses before that I know of. Biles and Turner both said the government bungled the V vaccine program in their opinion. Not in the distribution of the vaccine, but in the timing. They said the vaccine should have been made available up to a year before and in a greater area of Texas. But the area ranchers have survived the epidemic, the worst in years. And as a result, this 4-H horse show and many others will be presented across the state. The 4-H show here, by the way, will continue through Saturday. Jim Green, Channel 8 News on the Move, Fort Worth. I don't feel like that the local citizens should foot the bill at the tune of $1 million a year while the state keeps strapping expenses on us time and time again in each legislative session. I don't think that they are doing the job. I think they need to listen to the people in the local communities. We have a tax burden on us that in the year 1972, we'll be lucky if we get out of that year without cutting services in some way. One million dollars to us is a lot of money here in Dallas County. Of the prisoners. Well, I want to see them commit themselves, by whatever means are necessary, to a free, decent, and open society. And uh, I have certain views about our economic system, about our courts, about the political system, and I expose these to them. Some of them are very abrasive and harsh views, and I hope that they will think about the things I say, listen to other people, read, and then reach a decision by themselves. Redistricting the legislature is one of those complex matters that cannot be discussed in just a few words so that anyone can understand. And that's probably one reason why it's here being talked about before the Texas Supreme Court today. Suffice it to say that State Senator Oscar Mazzi of Dallas asked the Texas Supreme Court to order the redistricting commission to take on the job of rewriting House districts as well as writing Senate districts, the job that it already had because the legislature did not do so. Several others joined the suit on various other questions, and that was what was talked about here today. We asked Mazzi to outline for us the alternatives that the Supreme Court has. Chief Justice Calvert of the Supreme Court said during the hearing that this court is going to move very quickly to settle this matter. 
Some say that the decision could come as early as Monday. However, whatever the ruling from this court, it would seem possible and in probably it would be likely that the matter would next go to a federal court before there is any final decision on just how the legislators of Texas will be situated in districts to run for re-election in 1972. This is Roger McDonald, Channel 8 News on the Move in Austin. Speaker Mutcher's statement that was issued in written form said that he has told the truth when he testified four times under oath and he answered all the questions. He said he's convinced that the indictments are politically motivated to protect others and designed to destroy his future. He also hopes for an early trial and believes he will be exonerated. The grand jury, in addition to the indictments, issued a special statement which states that Texas lawmakers have been too busy granting political favors and being influenced in exchange for turning a fast buck rather than doing the business that the people of the state elected them to do. This, again, is the first criminal charges to come out of the Texas stock fraud case. There are other grand juries working, and there may be other criminal charges to come in the future. This is Roger McDonald, Channel 8 News on the Move at the Travis County Courthouse in Austin. The distinguished delegation was headed by Captain James Lovell. He once served on the board of directors of National Bankers Life Insurance Company. The other astronauts in Dallas today were Tom Mattingly, Fred Hayes, Dick Gordon, Charles Conrad, and Alan Bean. The group brushed briskly past us on their way to lunch today without so much as a smile or a friendly wave. When they came back down after lunch at about 2.45, their testimony apparently completed, I stopped Commander Bean in the hall and said, would it be relatively safe to assume that you have nothing to say to me, sir? He said, nothing personal. I have nothing to say to you or anybody else. In fact, we didn't even have anything to say up there. 
As noted, Captain Lovell once was on the board of directors of NBL. The question to be resolved here is whether the other five astronauts perhaps also at one time or another had stock in National Bankers Life Insurance Company. At this point, only the astronauts, the officials of the company, and the members of that grand jury know the answer to that question. The record does reflect that Sam Stock, who was once a president of National Bankers Life Insurance Company, did testify before a federal court in Dallas that at one time, two Dallas banks loaned an employee's fund $641,000. That money was subsequently used, he said, to buy 22,500 shares of NBL stock. Those certificates were issued with the names of those five astronauts on it. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move at the Federal Courthouse in downtown Dallas.